this afternoon lecture uh, features a guest from Paris, France, um, a DJ, producer, if you want so, electronic songwriter. Um, she has done records on Karat, Kill a DJ, um, and has currently released her debut, debut album, uh, The Waiting Room. Yeah, please give a very warm welcome to Chloe from Paris, France. Hello, everyone. Um, so, if you, if one looks your name up on Discogs, uh, there is a description saying uh, that your music is somewhere between German minimalism and dirty electro. But I think that's <laughs> it's kind it's of always a easier to give words to <clears throat> in which category you belong to, and in another way, I don't really like it because it's gives only a few words on a spectral of music. I like a lot of different style, but I think basically I like house music and I play house music in, in a general way. And um, yeah, but, but how, how did you get into it? Like? Um, I started to DJ more than 10 years ago, maybe it was 13 years ago. And uh, it was at, at a time uh, in France where electronic music was not so famous like how it is today, maybe. And um, I, I discovered electronic music because I started to go out in parties and I really liked it. And in France, there were raves going on and there were also uh, some... I was based in Paris, I'm still based in Paris, and there were some few, very few parties going on in some clubs, but mainly it was gay clubs. So there was like three gay clubs, and that was where there were house music, and uh, uh, also there were some techno DJs invited at Rex Club then, and um, then I, that's how I came into electronic music. I was in between, uh, the Rex Club, where Laurent Garnier has had his residency at that time. I think there's a lot of producers today that, uh, a French producer that were at Rex Club on Thursday and listen, go and listen to Laurent Garnier on Thursdays. And he was a big inspiration for a lot of, uh, the gen lot of uh, producers and DJs. So maybe, <coughs> maybe you can describe a little bit what was so great about Rex and Laurent Garnier on a Thursday night? The fact was that it was maybe one of the only party going on in, in Paris where it was, he was playing very eclectic music and uh, he made us discover uh, the whole house music and uh, he, you could understand how to build a set from the beginning to the end. And I think he keeps going and he still plays, he likes to play a lot, like three, four hours, six hours, because it's because of these parties. He still likes to show to the people that he can build a set, a six hour set, with a warm up and a peak time and the ending. And nowadays, it's uh, sometimes I feel it's a bit sad that because in some parties you are invited and you play two hours, one hour and 30 minutes. But I'm part of the these DJ who I really like to play more than three hours because you can express yourself much more. But um, do you, so? Do you think this makes sense at all? Like flying DJs around the world um, to places and clubs they've never been to, playing for people they've never seen before, knowing nothing about their um, musical education, you know? Like, isn't, isn't that the dream of a DJ then doing something what Laura Garnier has been doing at Rex Club? Like, playing every Thursday to a dedicated following? Rex Club was, and Laurent Garnier was really like the identity, the music identity were really together. And uh, at one point, the party became so famous that he was invited everywhere all over the world because of this party. And, um, um, I had a residency for eight years uh, in Paris in a place called The Pulp, and uh, this helped me a lot to understand how to build a warm-up. I mean, I could play differently from two, two o'clock or five o'clock or midnight, and I think it really helped me. And so then I think it makes sense to go and share the music. Uh, 
the promoters that invite you in general knows your music, knows the people and the crowd who are coming to the, to the club. So it should be a good combination. If it does not work, there's a problem somewhere. Maybe it was not the right moment or maybe there was a problem with, the, I don't know, the, I don't know. And how, how often does it not work for you? Uh, I play every weekend. Uh, um, I play uh, Friday, Saturday, and in general, uh, I go in clubs where the when I know the promoter. I've been basically maybe everywhere all over Europe, and all the promoters or clubs that invited me re-invited me now. So I go regularly in in some a lot of clubs all over the world, and uh, mainly in Europe. So the more the more you go and the more the crowd likes that you are here and then it's like kind of a residency. For example, I'm I'm resident in Frankfurt at Robert Johnson. I go and play there since maybe six years, every three or four months. Sometimes I don't play for eight months, but then suddenly I'm reinvited. Uh, I play sometime at Fabric in London too like uh, twice a year. It's residency, kind of residency, but it can be like every month, every two months, every six months. Whole. But uh, Robert Johnson and Fabric are quite different, right? From the way the clubs are. So maybe you can describe that a little bit, what constitutes a, a great club in, in your opinion? Uh, in my opinion, uh, it, it has nothing to do really with the country or... Uh, with, um, I think it can in one city it can it can be very different from one city. In one city you can have like five clubs and each club has its own uh, atmosphere, and you will be in this club because the other clubs it won't fit, you know. So Robert Johnson is a very very small club. Maybe it has I don't know 200 persons, you know. Maybe 400, but okay. not more. 400, when it's super packed, it's super. And the the good thing about Robert Johnson, it's it's not like underneath, it's uh, in front of the river. So it makes the thing really nice. And the sound system is really nice. And uh, the owners of uh, Robert Johnson is Atta from the label uh, Playhouse. And uh, the he took care of everything. He. He has a very good sound system and he likes to share. And um, he, he, The party stops, starts at 11 and can stop whenever it has to stop. Uh, there's no like uh, six o'clock, like in Paris, for example. It's maybe like in Berlin, there's, you, can, you can stop when you want to stop. I, I, I prefer to not to stop too late because in I don't like to play for too late people. <laughs> it's not the same music. In Berlin, they never stop, right? Yes. In Berlin, they never stop, but you have all these kind of clubs too, and I think you play the music for the kind of crowd you want to play. Um, maybe we can hear something that you would play in a club to give people an idea what, what kind of stuff you actually play. Okay, I have a uh, lot of tracks, but... Uh, I don't know what you want. It depends if you want like a <laughs> warm up or peak time. <laughs> so, Grigor uh, is a French uh, producer. He released uh, some uh, some EPs on uh, Karat Record, uh, the same label label on which I also released uh, my first EP. And uh, he's one of uh, a very good friend in the electronic scene. And we have a new project together that we started because the idea was to, to, to make, um, to share really something and um, to make lives together. Usually as a DJ, you, you always travel alone, you play alone and but you are with the people at the same time. And the idea was to make something, another project to make it with a friend of mine and to make the travel and uh, something going on with uh, someone who you have uh, the same atmosphere. 
So <laughs> people always uh, tend to forget about that part of being a DJ, right? That you spend a lot of uh, a lot of time at the airports and uh, alone in a hotel room somewhere. Um, when does that start to become tiring for you? Or is it not tiring at all and you love it all so much that it, well, it's a it, pleasure? It, it's, it starts to be tiring when, uh, when uh, I play too much. If I play too much when I go back home, uh, I don't have no more energy to hang up the phone, to, be, uh, to, to see my friends or to do normal things. I just want to go to bed and spend time quiet to take more energy. Sometimes it's uh, very, very tiring when uh, I play. I, at one time uh, I was playing too much and uh, I was playing like Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday and each day you're in a city and in a country and another day you have to leave the hotel room to take your plane. And you see only hotels, airports, cars, taxi, clubs. And there's a kind of repetition. And the great part is the moment where you are with the public. But you have all this around too. And you have to find the balance in between the, this moment you want to keep and you want to give the maximum energy. So I, I remember at that, at that time I really started to be really tired and I didn't even want to go and have dinner with the promoters before the party and everything. And I think it's a bit sad, you know, when you go to, to a party not to be with the promoters that invited you at least. So I decided to make it a bit uh, more quiet. So uh, I usually try not to take too much bookings. I mean, for example, if I play three times a week, uh, um, on a week, the next week I try to play once. Sometimes I don't take weekends. Or I really see all my plans and to keep my energy. And also because I produce, I need time also to be at home and produce and to have time to produce. So, and it's important to find time also to produce, especially at nowadays, because uh, I think all the DJs that today are playing, the main of them are producing. And I think it's very important to, to also produce, to be invited uh, as a DJ. So it's very important to fight this balance. So you, <coughs> you're, you're doing records these days to have a business card, so to speak, you know? So that yes, in a way, it, it's too true. It's, uh, there are so many, I mean, nowadays, uh, uh, you, everyone can DJ. I remember when I was 14, uh, I, I remember my dream was to have a guitar. So I had a guitar. And it's, it was not like so expensive. Today, a, ch a, a person who is like 13 or 14 years old wants to be a DJ. And so it's not the same economy because the parents have to pay for it. And it's really, really expensive. I remember in Paris, when I was younger, the people who had, um, who had the first, the, who were the first to have turntables, samplers to make music, because it w you had to buy samplers to make mu music. You had to buy synthesizer. You could not make music just with your compu computers. It was uh, the people who were rich, you know, the people who had money. So. It, uh, it was not possible for a lot of uh, the young people to have a... And there was not this... Uh, uh, yeah, all this electronic music was not so famous anyway. In, in Paris at least, right? Or? Um, I guess uh, everywhere. I mean, in Germany, in I Germany. think it was much bigger, of course. That was a big time also for Germany. And you think this... this uh democratization process is a good thing then to make uh, the, the production means available to everyone yeah I think it's uh, I, when I was younger I remember I, I really could not understand why this music was not so more famous I, I was really frustrated not to find this music on on CDs I, I was really frustrated that this music was seen very in a negative way uh, 
I was really like part of this person that really wanted to show to the people that this music, it was more than just, uh, I don't know, it was like uh, something special going on on this party. The, the meeting with the other people was totally different. And also the DJ, what he was expressing, I mean, that was totally different from a rock group or, I don't know, or just generalized music. And then it became famous. And always when it, something becomes famous, at one point you're very happy, but on the other side, the whole marketing also uh, took it his own way. I think it, it happens also the same maybe for rock and roll. And then marketing speaks bet more than the artist thing. I mean, it's good if you have marketing, if you can express yourself, but then if marketing makes you think you have to do this and this to work, then it kills the artistic thing, I think. So again, you have to find this balance <laughs> to make it your, your own way. And um, you, you always knew that you want to make music then? When you when you just mentioned when you were very young and uh, stumbled across that kind of electronic music, it was clear to you that you want to do it yourself. Um, actually, I I never planned really to become a DJ. It just happened. But uh, when I was younger, anyway, uh, I was really into music because my mother uh, she was uh, always into music, putting the music very loud. I was always complaining when I was younger because the music was too loud. It's usually the other way around. Exactly. Right? My mother it was very like all the time partying and she used to be also a DJ. She's uh, from, uh, she's English actually and she's, uh, as you can see my accent. <laughs> I'm kidding, but she, she used to, she used to DJ uh, in some clubs, but she was more like a disco jockey than a DJ, like she was playing tracks uh, and more like Motown things. And um, and my father had uh, this big collection of records of very classical stuff and also things like Pink Floyd, Beatles, and I was al always listening to it. And he was also playing guitar, so that's one of the reasons why I started to play guitar then. So I grew up with music and then I bought my guitar and I started to to um, to make music, and uh, then I discovered electronic music. But at, the, at that time also, I was uh, um, I, I had a, a group with another person, and we were doing things on a four-track mixer. We didn't have any material really to make uh, the music, so. So that's how uh, then when I discovered the technology of. Uh, how you can make electronic music. I used it in my, uh, with my guitar to make it uh, sound a bit better than a four-track mixer. And, but you don't have anything of that time with you, like stuff you did back then? No, I think it's not possible anyway to make it listen. The sound is too crappy and it's really, really silly. I mean, we did not really think too much. When we were doing the, the music, we were trying to find some noise, we were making noise, and I mean, it, in a way, maybe it's, if I make it listen now, I don't have it anyway, but uh, it's really silly music. <laughs> but um, do you have something like um, music that you were listening to back then, when, when you said from your mother or your father that you still listen to now, or that is still important to you? Yes, it's still very important to me, of course. Uh, um, Sometimes when I invite my mother, uh, she she likes that I put some of the music, but they are, uh, if I don't have music, she's really complaining, like, oh, you're really like uh, annoying, or not annoying, but like it's, you're not funny, you don't have music. And I, yes, I have music, but I'm not going to listen, make you listen now uh, to what I have. And if I don't have a Motown uh, record, or if I don't have, uh, I don't know, some tracks she likes, she, she doesn't want to listen to music. So, so she doesn't like the stuff you're doing now? But she likes my music. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, she's uh, quite proud of uh, my music. And she's, uh, when I make music, she listen, I make her listen, and I think she's a good point of view. If she likes, in general, uh, I think it's like, uh, okay, I think I'm on, on a good way. 
So she's the quality control? I think so, for me. <laughs> and um, what's her favorite track then of yours that you did? Uh, I think uh, maybe it's one of the tr uh, one of the track of my album. Maybe I can play it if you want. Mm -hmm. um, th it's uh, the, a track from my album called uh, the track is called uh, the door. Electronic uh, uh, things to make the music then as uh, as if you have a, you had a, a old band. And your voice as well, right? You mean that was your voice. Yes. One, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so you weren't too interested in making just a, a club album or something like that, you know? Yes, I produce also some uh, some club tracks, uh, but uh, I mean, yeah, I'm I w for my production, it was al always a bit different from my uh, DJing. Because when you DJ, of course, you pl you can play these kind of tracks at a, on a warm up, like really in the beginning. But in general, it doesn't make sense to play it in the middle of a party. And um, I think in the production, you have more uh, you have more space to make to express also yourself and make uh, whatever you want. And uh, on my album, I wanted to make the the expression of what I play and also what I produce. Try to find an in between. I think you can be very slow and you can have no beats but you still can find maybe some the same energy you can find on the club uh, this is what i really like and what i try to create in general and by finding the sounds i think uh, i'm really into uh, searching textures and also using the voice like an instrument i never put too much the voice uh, uh, up front like a, a real a real song. I mean, of course, I use it a bit like that, but it's never too much. So, and um, are lyrics then important for you when you say you just use the voice as an as an instrument? I'm not a writer. Like um, I usually don't write li lyrics r really, but uh, there are some ideas that comes comes uh, quite often. So anyway, I try to create a story. I try to anyway, uh, yeah. And um, you you mentioned Pulp, uh, the club where you started to play, and uh, if I'm not mistaken, it was with um, Jennifer Cardini and um, Ivan Smacke that you, or Smack, I don't actually know how you properly pronounce him in, in French, um, that you shared this residency. So maybe you can talk a little bit about this kind of scene in, in Paris and... Uh, how important it was for the city? Yes, yeah, so this club uh, uh, was existing like uh, since quite a long time and was not very interesting for the electronic scene because it was uh, during the day mainly uh, uh, dancing for all people. Uh, on Wednesday it was uh, rock parties. Saturdays it was a club just for girls. And we thought there was something missing. So we start. I started to play there uh, on Fridays, and it was parties for, it was gay, but it was gay friendly. And uh, from zero to three o'clock maybe, it was uh, generalist music, but the real generalist music. And then at three o'clock, uh, when uh, I started to play, uh, half of the club was leaving, and half of the club was staying. And there was a part of the people that were staying that didn't like the music because it was like new for them. So um, it was a very, a very important residency to, I mean, especially to create something with the public. And uh, at three o'clock uh, was a time where uh, people anyway are already uh, into uh, music and so we could play uh, it was we could play whatever we want, and then slowly we started to have the th the Friday to have like really from the beginning till the end, and that's how we started to then have uh, the whole night and do the warm up, and then the party started to become famous. So we had the, then the Thursday, and then we started to invite uh, international DJs, uh, and like uh, for instance, like who was important for you then or 
would it you like? For example, then? there were some artists from Compact that were, for example, one of the first to invite me in Germany. That was maybe in 2001 for me that I was playing in Germany. And uh, there were some, uh, these, these artists, we were invited them in, in pulp because anyway, uh, nobody, in, uh, nobody was really interested into this music. There was this record shop called Catapult in Paris and they were promoting this kind of music like uh, records from Germany and uh, mi music more minimal and uh, Catapult were also organizing parties sometimes at Rex Club and were inviting people too but it was really uh, slowly you know you slowly it was a work in progress inviting people like that and it was um, uh, the, the fr it was a free entrance too so that was kind of uh, new also for Paris to have a I don't know, an international DJ in a, in a small club and it, with a free entrance. So also that helped, I think, for the success of the, of the nights. Yeah, people like to come if, it, if they don't have to pay. Always. <laughs> and um, do, you have, do you have a track out of that time that was very important for you, that you always played or that always reminds you of? of it's it's a bit difficult to to make listen just one track to say okay this is representative of uh, of uh, of the club uh, maybe i don't know there there was this track that uh maybe uh, a lot of uh, of us were playing but because even the people that didn't like uh, electronic music liked this kind of track that you'll probably recognize. Yeah. Very classic uh, ones, but uh, that's one of the track uh, that was uh, quite easy to play for girls that didn't like electronic music. And, and it's still a track that I think is very important to electronic dance culture or house music. It, <coughs> it somehow captures that kind of uh, desolated, crazy feeling at 8 o'clock in the morning, right? Six. <laughs> or six o'clock, <laughs> yeah. And, uh, yeah, you, you said playing it for girls, so is it is it different to play at the gay party than playing at the mixed party, or...? That's what... I mean, does, does, does that matter? Actually, it's just that in Paris especially, uh, as I was saying in the beginning, the main parties with electronic music were because of the gay culture and the gay parties. So uh, the first parties I was invited to, that's why I was, rec uh, I was a resident of the pulp. And then to, I was playing also to still uh, other, some other gay party and I'm still playing in Paris sometimes to gay parties. And I think they're really funny and fun parties. But it's always like gay friendly, it's like really open, but it's really fun. It's a kind of atmosphere, it's really funny to go there. It's true that it's less serious than going to Rex Club, for example, listening to a DJ and uh, also the Rex Club has a really huge sound system, especially till this year, they change everything and you have uh, speakers everywhere. Maybe it's a bit more like fabric in London, like it's really like the culture of the sound and uh, with a good with a quality sound okay it's not the same kind of uh, music or thing you would play to a gay parties it's it's more I don't know the sound is more crappy so it's really different and in pulps the they prefer to put money for example for the light instead of putting money in the monitors so Okay, we grew up, we were this kind of DJ, we grew up with uh, this kind of uh, things. So we can go and play in kind of parties like Rex Club, but also we can play in more sound systems that are more crappy. So you have to, you, you always try to be careful with what you play. There are some tracks that are not good on some sound system and are better with another sound system. But um, but a shitty sound system doesn't matter as long as the party is fun for you. Then, 
if the sound system is crap, it doesn't matter to you as long as the party is fun. Because, I mean, if you if you were at Pulp for eight years playing and the sound system wasn't, I mean, that can, can be frustrating also, right? Yes, I think it can be frustrating if really the atmosphere is like if nobody cared, but the fact is that the people are so happy that you come and play, and at least if I have uh, the technical things I asked, uh, then uh, I can play. Sometimes I refuse if the sound system is really, really crappy to, because it's stress for me also. So then if you are stressed, you can share your music, really. And w what, what technical things do you require these days? I usually ask for a, a pioneer, this kind of pioneer, <coughs> CD player. Uh, I play, I have my uh, records and I have my Serato system. So I, I play Serato, I control it with CDs and I play also my vinyls, but I have to say that I, I play mainly with my Serato. The fact is that the whole system has changed and slowly imposed that we have to play this way. In Paris, for example, the, all the good record, sho record shops closed because nobody was coming anymore, really. Slowly, the kids, for example, that was basically the people that were really uh, uh, helping to promote also this music changed into Serato or Tractor. And I receive, I used to receive a lot of uh, vinyls, and uh, now I receive uh, downloads. So I play what I what I receive, and it's downloads. So when I like a track, I just ask if I could have a wave, not an MP3, and uh, then I continue to play with CDs because I used to have uh, these tracks on CDs. So it's just like the the same thing. But it's not it's not hurting the culture for you of vinyl. You don't I mean, you're not one of those persons who are very sad about that this whole DJ thing more and more transforms into a a, a digital kind of uh, affair. Of course, I would like to have uh, the I, I would love to, I would prefer to play on vinyls, but uh, there I would miss a lot of uh, tracks and a lot of new artists. I would miss a lot of things because in Paris we don't have no more good record shops. So if I'm in Berlin, I go in the record shops. If I'm in Frankfurt, I go in the record shops. But in Paris, it's a big city, but there's no more good record shops. There are maybe like one or two, but it's like really now not so good. So I play, I, I'm, as a DJ, you want to play the best and you want to play the best of what you feel, so you, you search and you have much more possibilities uh, through trying to find on the net. Of course, sometimes it's a bit tiring because during the week uh, you have uh, emails, uh, then I make music, I use my computer, then I play uh, on the weekend, I, I use my Serato. So sometimes it's a bit like uh, boring in a so way. So you're in front of a computer 24-7? Yes, like it's a, now it's a, it becomes like a real instrument. But at the same time, it gives so much possibilities and I think it's really good like for the new generation coming that they can have, they can play music and they can also make music with the softwares and the, for less money, you can, a lot of people can express themselves and I think it's very important that you can express yourself. And um, getting back to your album, there are also two tracks on there that you've actually done for um, a whole other project for a conservatory, right? So maybe you can talk a little bit mm -hmm. and explain what you were doing there, which is like a research kind of project. Yes, I was, uh, I was for four years in a conservatoire in Paris, in an arrondissement in Paris, and um, it was... Uh, very interesting because it was a, it actually it was ele an electroacoustic class. So the idea was to help you to make an electroacoustic track. So during the whole year, you had to think about uh, to make a project like this. So it was very, 
quite of a new experience to make a track in for you make a track in one year, which is quite a long time. So I was there for four years, so I did four tracks. But how does it, why does it take so long, a whole year? I had a, a teacher that was uh, very interesting, and he was a, he's a composer in electroacoustic. He's a, from uh, Argentine. His name is Octavio Lopez, and he's, uh, he was really into uh, helping us uh, and pushing us in the between the concrete music and electroacoustic, and we had to work with an instrument. We had to work with a professional instrumentalist. So f the first year, I worked with a contrabassist, and uh, it, it takes you a long time because you have uh, to learn the how the contrabass plays, what are the different uh, possibilities, the classical possibilities, and then the contemporary possibilities. And then you, you record with him some sounds, from uh, basic sounds to more uh, different sounds like he can make. And then you put in uh, your session, and, um, and the idea is to make, I, I was making a track with the texture of the contrabass. All the sound was taken from the contrabass, and I was using a lot of different softwares, like every kind of possibilities I could use, and you could not recognize that it was made for, uh, with the contrabass. And then the contrabass, at the end, you write for the contrabass, and he plays on your track. And it has to be in one piece. So it's really electroacoustic, really in between. And on my album, I just took like uh, 20 seconds or 50 seconds of uh, two pieces I did, which makes interludes in my album. So I can, for example, make you listen uh, that um, extract of... Uh, How long are those tracks in their original form then? Uh, they are maybe 15 minutes, uh, but the interesting thing is that you can make whatever you want. Even if you make two minutes, it's a concept for them, so it's like interesting. But in one year, it does not make sense. So uh, in general, it took, yeah, it's like between 10 and 15 minutes, but it can be 30 minutes too. But the, the um, finding the textures and putting them, uh, it's not at all uh, synthesized music, you know? It's only textures that you edit from one millisecond to one second, and it's not like just like playing a synthesizer, for example. Mm. Everything is uh, anyway. So this is uh, an extract, really short one of a. Uh, yeah. So this is really made only with a contour bass. You could you could hear the boom, the the chord uh, of the cello hitting, uh, uh, for example. And there's uh, for example there's another one, and it's uh, also a short interlude I put in my uh, album. And it uh, the 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 first sound is the flute.
And so at the, at the end of the year of this conservatoire, which here represents the, the piece, as they say. And you, you get a degree or what? Or is it just? No, it's just a project. And it's really personal projects. And it's just to help you to make it. And, uh, and you are in the room. And there are 80 speakers all over the place. And you are with a mixer. But it's not a normal mixer because it's an inverse mixer. So you control the old speakers and you specialize your, your piece. So you can switch speakers on and off or? Yes, exactly. It's, uh, and each speaker has its own. Uh, yeah, there are some speakers that have more bass, some uh, that have, are more clear. So you make the sound come from here and go to there. So yeah, you specialize it. And this helped me a lot in my electronic composition anyway. That was very inspiring anyway to, it pushed me more and uh, to compose and find textures and I really liked it in this way. I don't pretend to like say, uh, okay, now I do, I do contemporary piece. It's just for me like a, uh, a new tool and I just take what I'm interested into it. And I just added it in my composition. Yeah, yeah. I was just about to ask you what attracted you to this more conceptual way of making music than instead of just having like this normal club track that has uh, 16 bars in the beginning and in the end to mix in and out. And, and I think it's very inspiring to not to stay all the time, 100%. It's what you were saying earlier, like well, sometimes it can be repetitive and like the DJ life. And I try to always find something new and something a bit different to make it, uh, to make it, uh, I don't know, more exciting. So I'm always searching and going from one side to another. That was very interesting for me to do that. I did that for four years. For, for real, I like for maybe two years and a half, I was 100% into this, I was listening to many kind of uh, contemporary tracks, concrete music. I was starting maybe to go somewhere else, but then at one point I was like, okay, then it's too much. Um, I'm a bit fed up with it. I think it's interesting, but okay, I know what I, well, how it is. And it's like when you DJ, you DJ a lot, DJ a lot, and then at one point it's too much. So again, it's a new balance. And and what do you think um, about the current state of of like electronic music, if you want to use that term? Because you you mentioned like uh, minimal uh, a few minutes ago, and the, it's almost like a curse word nowadays, right? No one wants to be minimal, but everyone is, or something like that. Yes, it's uh, always more helpful, maybe to some people who doesn't know really about um, what you are doing to put uh, a, a tag, tag on, it. on it. So I can understand this way. But you know, for example, for my album at, uh, at the shop, I, I know that uh, there are some shops that didn't know in which category put it. Okay, shall we put it in folk music or shall we put it in electronic music? And finally they put it in electronic music because I'm more well known in electronic music and I and because I used more maybe electronic sound, I don't know. I could make a, tr a folk track with the electronic, I mean, with uh, the help of uh, the whole system of an electronic system. So I think it's a bit boring sometimes that people or, I don't know, some people like to always tag like this. Um, but I believe the people, uh, if they are interested into your music, they are, they they know what you are doing anyway. But but you wouldn't describe your music as minimal then? Would it can be minimal, but not only. Sometimes the more minimal uh, the it is everywhere, the more house you want to play, you know? It's just like, uh, and you make dance the people. So in one set I can play, of course, minimal, but you have uh, really nice tracks, house tracks that are minimal. Uh, I don't know, it can be... Uh, everywhere. And um, how often does your gender play a role in what you're doing? I mean, you started at a time where it was still um, like a curiosity that 
uh, a woman is a DJ and like these stupid terms like DJ and, and, and stuff like that. So w what do you think about it's yeah. funny because uh, I didn't know, like in France we say DJ. I didn't know, a like, DJet. I mean, I, I, kn I knew later that uh, DJ was, uh, because my second name is Jane, so I was DJ. And like, oh, how, how do they know my second name? <laughs> I was quite surprised, but then I understood. I think it's nicer in English anyway. DJ is nicer than yeah, DJ. DJ in French, when you put et at the end of the words, it's a diminutive, you know? So. It's diminutive, you know what I mean? So I'm not like fighting to say, okay, I want to f a feminine word of my category, uh, okay. But um, it's true that uh, at the beginning I was quite surprised to see how some people were looking uh, as if they were in the zoo, you know? And it, it was a bit like annoying. And I really understood like, okay, uh, of course we are in a world where the gender is very important, but it was maybe more difficult 10 years ago than what it is, uh, how it is today. I mean, uh, there are some women here in the room, and I guess yeah, there was... Thank God. Yes, and uh, I think maybe 10 years ago, if there was... Uh, I'm not sure there was so many... If, if you put the same room, I'm not sure there would be more, more the same quantity. Could be a bit more men, yeah. But... I I know that uh, there was some uh, few years ago. I remember there were some uh, uh, some girls coming to me and saying uh, when I was DJing and say, hey, you know what? I started to DJ because I could see it was possible for me to DJ, and you know, and I at 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 one time I was not on on one hand I was not understanding really this, but on the other hand I was like, oh, this is cool because it gives the idea of uh, to some other people first, but also to some. Other girls? Yeah, but you do it with your ears, your head, and your hands, and not with your private parts yes. anyway, right? That's why I could not understand also. And um, yeah, there was also like a, um, a, like a thing called the dysfunctional family, you and Ivo Smaka did, right? That somehow aimed at that topic. Yes, the dysfunctional family, this compilation was probably because of this. The funny thing, for example, I mean, the, this club in Pulp uh, was really the, there was a lot of, uh, okay, there was some guest party, there was a lot of, uh, uh, I mean, it was a mixture of different styles of music on uh, each day. And we liked this idea of promoting one club and it was uh, many different identities. And I think it's the same in the music. You know, when we you were, saying about minimal or this. This is again about like identity. It's not about like the style, you, okay, you can say you play this style or this style, but it's more about the personality. So, I mean, we did this compilation called The Dysfunctional Family because we thought like, okay, let's do a compilation and it's not like a real basic mix CD, DJ mix, but it's, it's just the continuity of different tracks and so they are like uh, pop folk tracks in between of a big electronic track and then something else more disco. Uh, but it's just our own vision and it's just like music we like. And so we did this cover on which uh, I'm more like a male and uh, Yvonne is shaved and is more like a female. And uh, it was uh, the whole identity, all about this identity and gender stuff. Um, and do you have it? Do you have something from the compilation with you? No, because it's track from the. Um, it's uh, really different tracks. Uh, uh, maybe I have one. I have to see. Well, it's a track of uh, of a folk um, artist. So, what what track is this, or was this? So, this is not the original track because I could not find it. <laughs> 
But it's uh, Jason Edwards, he's an American uh, songwriter, so normally it's more folk. But this is a remix uh, of uh, Tiger Timing, and it was released on uh, uh, the label Kill the DJ, the label we have with uh, Ivan Smag and uh, two other person who we were working at Pulp. Why is it called Kill the DJ? I think the, that was first the name of the party at Pulp. Uh, it was a time where, in general, uh, the house music were, was very, um, maybe more housey, more positive vibes, and we were playing more dark music and more, I don't know, more sounds from Germany, more sounds, maybe it was a bit more cold, and it was... A lot of parties in, in France were named, like, uh, for example, there was a, they, they still is a very big party called Respect. And I think it was to contrabalance with uh, this kind of uh, ID and to make it a bit different, you know. When we started the party at Pulp, it was a, a new generation and a new idea of making parties with new style of music, new artists new way of promoting music. So maybe that was the general idea, I don't know. So the other side of the coin, then, so to speak, if respect is more, um, I guess, more the American house kind of thing, right? Or Actually, yes, because it's true that um, there was a, a peak time for American labels, American artists in the 90s, and, and then slowly, geographically changed and it went between maybe, yeah, more in Europe. So, yeah, maybe it was the beginning at that time. Like, slowly it was changing. And you also, with your new album now, you also started to play live, right? Yes, um, I start. Uh, it was a long time I was thinking to, to play uh, live. And uh, I... With the guitar then? Or? No, that's why I, I was very... I could not... Imagine a live, like, uh, for example, make a live of 100% guitar and singing. I mean, I'm first a DJ and I'm a producer at home. And this was the idea of making a live, for example, with a guitar and in front of people singing and being in front totally, was totally up the other side of, of, maybe it was too much new, maybe it was not the whole idea of what I was making. And I w as I was saying before, my music is more, I'm more behind and it's, my, if, for example, if I use my voice, it's, re it's really mixed with the whole instrument and, and more with an instrument. So it took me time to make a live because of this reason, because I could not see really a big example of someone typical, like who is in like really in the DJ uh, life and making totally different style of music. I really wanted to find uh, an in-between. So I finally found an in-between and I just found some, I took some sounds of tracks I already did it and I play uh, it uh, on some uh, beats but it's more slow than my DJ set but it's upper than my album. So it's a real in-between. And um, yeah, what is your favorite way of doing it then? You also said once that you started different and changed yes. it later. When I, when I did my first live, I was in front of my computer and uh, I, all my live was maybe like uh, uh, every live, like, you know, which track you play. And okay. So I just start and stop and some effects or? No, because I, it was not sequenced. Um, I had this, uh, but I, I, I knew what I was going to play and at what moment it was going to happen. I was like, I really prepared it. You know, when you are really stressful, you really prepare, like really carefully to make sure nothing is lost and you don't think too much while you make your life. So the first life I did it like this. So for me, it was really new because I, it was really mo more down tempo, and the people were not like dancing as when I play DJ. So the so the feeling with the people, the perception with the people, uh, was uh, very different. 
and but I didn't like being just being the laptop like that and uh, and uh, knowing exactly what I was playing. So I really had to rethink my life, and so I re I really understood my, how my life was going to be. Uh, when I suddenly realized I'm, I'm, uh, my, the mixer uh, uh, had to be in front of me, like when I play as a DJ, and the computer on another side, and then I started to bring some other stuff, um, like uh, Roland TR707 for the beats. I have uh, an FX machine for, uh, for all kind of delays. I have a Chaos Pad 2 for all kind of uh, effects and uh, for a few synthesizers and uh, other other stuff like this. And now it's much more fun because also I change everything in my computer for that I'm more free to play whatever I want and I take more risk like when I DJ because when I go DJ I don't know exactly what I'm going to play. So I feel much better this way just with few uh, few stuff on my uh, on my uh, computer and then i feel better like that so it's really live then it's more live but still it's like not an instrument i'm using so i have to prepare sounds before anyway i can i can for sure loop voices and use my voice again as an instrument for example my chaos pad 2 uh, if i play uh, with my voice, then I uh, use my chaos pad and it makes a sound and uh, according to how I do it on my microphone, the sound change a bit and it makes a uh, new sound so it's yeah it's quite uh, interesting when you are performing the live it's more exciting than just like pushing play you know what I mean and yeah, I would like to open it up now for a few questions. If you have any, that is. The microphone is on its way to you. <laughs> Hello. Um, where do you, how do you lay out your live set mainly? Sorry? How do you lay out your live set mainly? Is it in Ableton or? Yes, I use uh, Ableton, Live Ableton. Uh, I use uh, I, no, I don't use the, the side where you can arrange. I use the side with the clips. Yeah. So I have like, for example, for one track, I have only two, two, um, two levels where it can work all together. But then I can change from one clip to another clip to another clip to another clip. And this is more exciting, I think than just doing all the same exactly. Because it can be very different from one atmosphere to in another. And even if I, I, I think just before what I'm going to, to play, okay, I will start like this, but just before. It's only when you are here that you can know, you can know what you play. Like room for improvisation kind of thing. Like, yeah, for the room and the atmosphere. For example, this weekend I played in this festival. I don't play so much live. This is the first year I perform live. But I played it in a uh, few festivals. And uh, I've, I have to say it was very stressful because I don't play so much lives. But, at, for example, this weekend I played uh, on the... I played in France, in festival, in a festival called Name Festival in the north of uh, France. And the next day I played in the south of France. And the two atmospheres were totally different. That was really different. Uh, on the north, it was I, I felt I had to play more dubby, more bass, you know, not too much high frequencies. And in the south, it was the opposite. I felt I could play more high frequencies, you know. So that was funny, you know. Thanks. Uh, behind you. Um, you said you were you had the residency of this club for eight years. So do you ever like have this problem like the same menu, same audience? Do you are are you having any problems with the with this? Have you ever had like was it like boring sometimes or? You mean uh, when I was playing there? 
Yeah, you are. You play there every weekend. Yeah, same was, venue, same people. Mm, normally, I think it was at the beginning. It was a bit uh, boring in a way. At, really, at the beginning, because the people didn't know your music, didn't like your style. Really, did not like you so much because you were cutting their what they were wanting. You know. So at the beginning, it was a bit hard. I have to say. But uh, at the same time, it was a good school to see how the people can like finally your music and, and how, um, of course, at the beginning, there were some people coming and yelling at me like, hey, what are you doing? Uh, now go away. I want my DJ, the normal DJ who is playing there, you know? So this is a good school, but because now wherever I go, wherever, uh, if something like that happened and thanks God it does not happen anymore, it can happen, uh, then uh, in a way I don't care, you know? I mean, I don't feel, s you, you take care of your sensibility. It's very important not to be touched too much because it can then interfere in your artistic expression. And also, um, you're performing very often, like pr three times a week. And how do you sort it out with the um, your selection? like? Do you get bored of your selections? How do you sort it, sort it out? Uh, I never play the same set from one party to another. I take, um, I, I'm trying not to play the same set anyway, because anyway, it can be very different from one club to another. That's what I was saying, for example, for this weekend. You, you can know only what you are playing, just like uh, the time you enter in the club, the time the crowd is in. And usually I go often in some clubs, so I know what kind of atmosphere is going to be, but I never play the same set. Mm -hmm. I think it's more exciting anyway, yeah. and even for the people. Yeah, thank you. Any more questions? No one. Then I would say thank you very much, Chloe. Thank you.